program Curiosity Show titled Hovering Tongues, Pricking Drums, key number C8324, recorded 24th, the 833, replay is scheduled duration 25 minutes. Hello and welcome to the Curiosity Show. We often talk about tying reef knots. Do you know what a reef knot is? Well, I'm sure you do. But in case some of you are not sure how to tie one, here's what you do. You start with the right-hand piece of rope and you put it over the left-hand piece of rope. Right over left. And then you tuck it under. And then the piece that's in your left hand goes over the right and tuck it under. So that's right over left, left over right. If you do that correctly, you'll have a reef knot. And you can always tell if it's a reef knot because it looks nice, neat, and symmetrical. And it's actually two loops joined together. Now, I thought just for fun, I'd try and make our reef knot a little bit more secure. I'll take the piece that's in my right-hand side and I'll just pop it down through the centre of the big loop that's sitting there then take it up and poke it back through the knot itself. That'll make it nice and secure, won't it? And then we'll have something that's even stronger than a reef knot, won't we? So we'll pull it tight and the knot vanishes into thin air. Isn't that amazing? Did you see what I did? I'll do it again. I did start with a genuine reef knot, right over left and then left over right. But what I did after that was really quite cunning. I undid the knot by taking the right piece and putting it down through from the top of this loop then bringing it up around the side and then this is important it has to go over the top of that one and back through the knot and then when you pull it tight you watch what happens it looks as if it's going to be an amazingly complicated knot but the little bits gradually untangle themselves and eventually the rope turns out to be a straight piece without any knot at all so the knot didn't really vanish into thin air. It was just a trick knot. But there are a lot of things in this program today that are all about air. Sounds absurd, but in fact, there is a way. This looks like a hand drill, but from the way it's shaking around when I crank it, it would have made an awful mess of your woodwork. So it wasn't a hand drill. So what was it? Well, believe it or not, this is a device for giving yourself a massage, as the old publicity photographs so clearly show you. You could use it on a friend, or on your head, even your stomach, or your chest, or your foot. It was a very versatile implement. I'm not sure how effective it was, but it worked like this. It really was rather like a hand drill. You cranked a, a handle back here, and what that did was to turn a shank and make this revolve. But instead of having a bit there, as you have with a drill, it has this large circle of heavy steel, and it's placed off-center. So as you crank, 
the weight is flung around top and bottom, left and right, and it makes the whole thing vibrate. Well, those vibrations were transmitted through this sort of arm to whatever head you happen to put there. That's a flat disc, but you could also use a rather spongy, soft, uh, rubbery one. Well, say I wanted to give myself a jaw massage. I'd get the implement and put it in position like that. Then I'd start to crank the handle. And apart from the fact that it makes speaking somewhat difficult and gives you double vision, I suppose it was a massage of a sort. Time to do a little mind reading. In a moment I'm going to ask you to think of a number between 1 and 20 and I will guess that number. Actually, you're not here in the studio, so we'll ask our director, John, to join in with us. Will you do that for us, John? I certainly will. Okay. Now, I want you to think of a number between 1 and 20, John, and don't say anything, but make it appear on the screen. Right, I've got that. Now, you all know what the number is. I don't. I'm going to get you to do some things with that number, and the first of those is to multiply by 5. Yes, I've got that. Okay. Now add on the number of hours in a day, 24. Okay. Now times two. Got that. How are you going at home? One more thing to do. Take away eight. Yes, I've got an answer. Okay. I hope you all have the same answer, the one that John has put on the screen for you. It's probably quite a large number. In a moment, I'm going to get you all to say it. And I hope those thought waves will come through to me and I will instantly know not just that number, but the number that you started with. Instantly. Here we go. Are you ready to say the number on the count of three? One, two, three. The number is 110. Seven. You started with seven. Am I right? Well, of course I am. It's not as magical as it might appear if you stop and think what I made you do with those numbers. For example, if we start with another number, say another one, John. Three. Okay. We start this time with three, and uh, I'll make you do the same things with it. Multiply by five, and you end up with 15. Then add 24, 39. Then times two, 78. Then take away eight, and you're back to 70. Now, if you stop and think about it, what I did was made you multiply by 5 and multiply by 2. That's multiply by 10. I also made you add on 24 and then multiply that by 2. So you added 48, then you took away 8. So those last three steps meant that you really added 40. Now, in order to get from the number we end up with back to the beginning number, we have to do two things. One is take away 40 and the other is divide by 10. There's a quicker way of doing that. Simply chop off the naught, you have seven, take away four, and you're back to three. And that happens every time. In the first case, you ended up with 110. I chopped off the naught, 11, and I took away four, back to seven. If you end up with 160, chop off the naught, 16, take away four, and you're back to 12. That was the number you started with. So there's a little trick involving numbers and mind reading, and you can try it on your friends. Drums, for all that they make an impressive noise, are essentially simple musical instruments. Just a barrel of something, metal or plastic or wood, and a skin stretched over the top. And when you hit the skin, it vibrates, vibrates the air inside and makes a booming sound. So you get the jungle drum sound. Well, hard to make one as good as that, but you can get a piece of PVC tubing, stick a piece of cardboard over the end and hit it. 
and you get a good, solid, meaty drum sound. But that's not the only sort of drum you can make. You can hit them on the side too. And these are just made of wood, hard wood, and they make a pleasant, hollow sound. And drummers use wood blocks in bands today. And an African tongue drum was a huge woodblock. You hit it on the side and it made a booming sound. This one isn't because it hasn't been treated. Here's how you treat it. You won't be able to work on a large tree trunk. I don't think you'll be able to find one. Anyway, it's too hard. But uh, PVC piping is just the stuff. And if you can't get PVC piping that's big by being fat like that, go for stuff which is big by being long like that. Short bits don't work too well. I'm going to use them because I haven't got much space. But go for a long bit. See if you can get a plumber who's got some offcuts for you. Well, PVC is really just hard plastic, and it can be easily cut. If you're desperate, a hacksaw blade will do it, but it's best to try for one of these things, a keyhole saw. You'll notice that that's got a sharp point which can easily get into holes, and yet the blade is fairly thick, so it cuts quite a wide groove. And both of those are things you're going to need. Well, turn the pipe around, and I've already done it. You draw four holes and drill them out like that. Two there, and in line with them, two here. Use a bit that leaves a large enough hole for your saw blade to get into. And that's another reason for this particular sort of saw blade. It gets into holes like that very easily. The hacksaw blade has to be forced in, and it's uh, not so good to work with. When you've done that, join those two and those two. It's quite easy. Be careful of your fingers. It's quite a safe saw to use. Keep your fingers away and just keep cutting. You'll find with the keyhole saw, it cuts remarkably easily. You don't even need the handle if you can't afford that, the blade will do. When you've finished, that down there and that down there cuts a ribbon and it looks like that. And that would do as a tongue drum. If I hit it, you'll hear a sort of pocking sound. We can do even better than that by splitting it across there with a keyhole saw. Makes a long tongue and a short tongue. We should get different notes. Cut it across there, and that's the finished product. Now, I said these are short, they won't make much of a sound, but you can vary that by covering the ends. Here we are. If I cover the end with a piece of cardboard cut to fit, here's one end covered. A bit of difference. Cover the other end, and a bit more difference. Not very good, because we haven't gone to the long tube. Here it is, I've made three tongues there, cut a hole there to let the sound out, and covered one end, and left the other one open. And that's quite a respectable tongue drum. And if I'd gone to the wider tube, I would have got more of a booming sound, like this. In this case, one end's covered, like that, the other one's covered with a hole cut in it. Experimentation's a great thing with tongue drums. Well, you won't be able to get a beater like that, unless you know a drummer. So the next best thing is to grab a cork and jam it on a stick, or, in this case, a piece of metal. And that makes a nice heavy beater, which is fairly soft to the touch, and you've got a tongue drum.
12 matches arranged to form a group of squares. There we are. Now, here's the problem. If you remove two matches, how many squares remain? Well, if you remove those two, you can see that three squares will remain. Or, if you remove these two, three squares remain. But I say to you, there is a way of removing two matches so that just two squares remain. Can you work it out? Take away two matches to leave just two squares. Well, how do you do it? I guess you've worked it out already. You don't remove matches from the outside, but you take away two from the inside, and you're then left with a small square here, and a large square there. Two squares. Here's a question I bet you don't know. How big was Rampharynchus? Well, about that size. Almost a meter across from wingtip to wingtip. But first of all, what was Rampharynchus? Well, you've probably heard of the pterodactyls, creatures from the age of the dinosaurs. Rampharynchus was the earliest of them. Technically, it was a flying lizard. It had the body of a lizard, or very much like it, and wings rather like today's bat's wings. In fact, it had a number of very interesting features to it, but I can't show them to you on a model as crude as this. We really ought to go and look at some very good models from the Melbourne Museum. Now, Rampharynchus flew, but it probably didn't fly actively like birds of today. It probably glided instead. It had hind limbs like a lizard's and a tail which ended in a sort of rudder. It had a diamond shape on the end for steering through the air. And those wings could be folded like a bat's wings today. We don't know if it could crawl, but it could certainly hang on the sides of cliffs with those clawed fingers on the front hand. It had three of them like that, and the fourth formed the edge of that very long wing. It was rather like a bat's wing. It could be folded up. It had teeth, probably like a goanna's, very good for grabbing things. Perhaps it grabbed them in flight, or perhaps it dived down and caught fish in the waters of the dinosaur era. They were very good grabbing teeth at any event. So that was Rampharynchus, one of the forerunners of the pterodactyls. If you wanted to go across the English Channel from England to France, there are several ways you could go. You could go by boat, by plane, you could swim, or you could take a hovercraft. Now a hovercraft is an unusual means of transport. It actually floats on a cushion of air. How can something float on a cushion of air? Well, when you go camping and you have an air bed, you're floating on a cushion of air then. Or if we take a balloon, that's a cushion of air when you blow it up. There it is, cushion of air. And that will actually hold up some weight. How much? That's a good question. If I tie a knot in it and put it down on the table and apply some pressure, you can see that it's resisting quite a bit of that pressure. But how much pressure could some balloons stand? Tell you what, we'll find out. We'll put some balloons on this table. Thanks, Rob. We'll spread them out, then we're going to try and put something over the top which weighs quite a bit. Got that in, and I think that'll do Rob for a start, and one over there. And we're going to take another table now and invert it, turn it upside down and see if those balloons will hold up the weight of a second kitchen table. Here we go. Rest it on the edge. And then we'll hold the legs, we'll bring it up, and very, very gently lower it down. And watch the balloons. See if our cushion of air will hold up the table. Right, and let go of your end. It's wobbling around a little bit. I'll let go of my end. And by golly, I think we've done it. Tell you what, we'll put a few more in, Rob, around the edges, just to uh, make our cushion of air a little bit larger. And some at the sides. Thank you. Put up the front here. Another pink one around the front. 
and our cushion of air is taking up most of the space between the tables. Then the next test will be to see if we can add a little more weight to our hovercraft. It's really a bit like a hovercraft and uh, see if it still stays there. That's it. That's it. Okay, that'll be the last one, which we'll tuck in the back. And we really need some substantial weight to put on top of our model hovercraft. I think I'll be the pilot. Rob, could you steady the sure. legs, just in case it doesn't work? And I'll try treading on the middle there. Then it'll not only be the weight of the table, but my weight as well. Here we go. There we are. So far, so good. Okay, Rob's let go, and it's holding me up. I wonder if it would hold a couple of other people. Maybe James and Detlef could come and join me on the hovercraft, and we'll see if it'll hold us. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. Watch the balloons, see how many we burst. Okay, one person, two people, three people aboard. Wow, one balloon's gone. Now, the big test is to bring Rob up here, which will give us a total of about 300 kilograms. Let's see if our hovercraft will hold. And there we are. <laughs> Four of us on board, 300 kilograms. Our hovercraft is working. And if you think this is amazing, have a look at this, which is a real hovercraft going on land and on the water. Sounds absurd, but in fact, there is a way. To finish with, a problem. I'll tell you the problem, but not the answer. You have to work that out yourself. It's easy. You'll need two round pencils, a ruler, and a piece of paper. Here goes. First of all, you make a mark on the edge of the piece of paper, and that's the starting line of a rather peculiar little race between the ruler and the pencil. So we'll put the pencil down and the starter's gates with its pencil on that, on its pencil point on the mark. Now we need to measure a distance of 10 centimeters down the track. Here we are, another mark, and that's the finishing line. And we move the ruler back so that the ruler and the pencil start together, and we'll shove the other pencil down here to act as a second roller. Now this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to push the ruler down towards the finishing line, and of course to get there, it's going to go through 10 centimetres, like that. But as it does so, it's going to roll the pencils. And so the pencil points will also move down towards the finishing line. So here's the problem. If I make the ruler go from there to there, a distance of 10 centimetres, how far will the pencil point go? Will it go the full 10 centimetres, or 5 centimetres, or in between the two, or less than 5? And that's a problem for you to work out. We'll see you next week. Curiosity.